sing Amazing Grace, how oh, sweet the sound. Saved a wretch like me. <coughs> Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. before we look at God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Uh, we thank you for the blessings of this morning and your word, uh, its your power and its authority for us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for what we've just been singing and for the, the truths of that, Lord, about your amazing grace, stepping down from the, uh, the light of heaven into the darkness of this earth to bring light to this world. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us each day and this day. And we pray now, Lord, as we come towards the close of this day, that you would help us as we come to your word, to hear your voice and to know it speaking to our hearts. So, Holy Spirit, we pray you'd help us and uh, keep us alive and open our ears to hear what your spirit is saying to us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Good. Right. Lovely to have you here. Um, we are. If you want to, if you've got a Bible, you can turn to Luke chapter nine, 
Um, we we got the work. The, 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 <laughs> <laughs> thought it was Dream sneezing then, it's usually here. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Right, so yeah, Luke chapter 9, and the words will come up on the screen for the, as we read through it, but then we will be referring to little parts of it, so if you wanted to follow it, you could do. Um, right, so we're, we're, uh, in your Bible, so Luke chapter 9, we're going to read from verse 18 down to verse 27. We've been looking at this, the disciples and uh, over kind of, we've been sort of split up a little bit. We had the choir, didn't we? Uh, and various other things we've had. Last week we had the Spanish Gospel Mission. It's great to have them here. And uh, Pastor Sergio. I don't know if I can compete with Sergio's suave, sophisticated Spanish uh, suntan or anything else like that. But uh, hey, ho, this is where we are, isn't it? So you're just stuck with me tonight. And so we're back to from ordinary to extraordinary, how God changes when we put things into God's hands, he turns the ordinary stuff into extraordinary. The extraordinary being, not brilliant to us, but how great God is. God is, does wonderful works. When Jesus said to his disciples, you know, I've got to go to the Father, but you will do greater works than the things you've seen so far. He didn't mean better quality. He just meant so much more. This gospel isn't just for you in this little place here. It's to go around the world. 2,000 years later, there's millions of people have come to Christ as a result of the preaching of this wonderful word, hasn't it? Haven't they, rather? They're the extraordinary things that Jesus was talking about. And we are disciples, so we can learn from them. And tonight we're going to talk about our gospel identity. It's important we know and we believe what kind of saviour we have, who Jesus really is. And that's what we're going to read about tonight. So Luke chapter 9, verse 18 to 27. Once, when Jesus was praying, Luke does a lot of talking about Jesus at prayer. He emphasises that. Jesus, the Son of God, who didn't really need to pray, if anyone didn't need to pray, it was him, wouldn't it? You'd think that, wouldn't you? Uh, but he does. He communicates with his Father in every and every, any and every situation, sometimes overnight. And when he actually chose the disciples, if you remember, he, cho he, he prayed all night before he did that. Big decisions and things. Anyway, um, so once when Jesus was praying... In private, he, uh, and his, his disciples were with him. He asked them, who do the crowds say I am? Who do the crowds say I am? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. And Jesus says, what about you? Who do you say I am? And Peter answered, God's messiah jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone and he said the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life and then he said to them all whoever wants to be my disciple that's us must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me for whoever wants to save their life will lose it but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. So that's our reading for this evening. Jesus' hard-hitting words about it matters what you believe about me and that will, that, what you believe about me will form your identity, not just now, but for eternity. It'll matter, it'll change you. It'll turn you from ordinary to extraordinary. So gospel identity, if you like. Who are we? Who is Jesus? Depends on that, doesn't it? It's the big question Jesus asked, and he asked it twice. We mentioned this last time we were here, if you were, if you were here. Before um, the feeding of the 5,000, uh, Herod is asked this, asking this question. Who is this man? Who is this Jesus? And then Jesus then asks his disciples, who is this, you know, who, who do people say that I am? But more importantly, he comes and zeroes in on them and says, well, what about you? What do you, who do you say that I am? Who do you say? Who you think Jesus is will affect every, the whole way you live, won't it? We know that, don't we? Who we believe Jesus is, is will affect everything that we do, all of what I should do. Should change everything. If he really is the son of God, if he's really died for us, if he really gives us power through the Holy Spirit to live a life for him, 
it should change us. And by and large, for most of us here tonight, Christians, it does change things, doesn't it? We aren't the people we used to be. We aren't the people we were probably going to be beforehand. But we're probably not the people we should be completely yet. Luke begins with uh, Jesus at prayer again, as I said. It's a crucial thing, isn't it? Luke has a theme around Jesus praying. Because this is a huge moment for disciples and the church. So remember, the disciples have been in training. They've been watching Jesus do all these amazing miracles, hearing all the wonderful teaching, and they've been around with him and seen him do all these things. And now they've been sent out on mission with, uh, on their own. And they've just come back and they've seen wonderful things happen. And it's been great and they've reported it back. And Jesus has, you know, took them on. Uh, the next last thing we looked at was then Jesus feeding 5,000 people with a meagre five loaves and two fish. And everyone is full and satisfied. In Jesus' kingdom, that's what it's like. Even with the most meagre things we can offer him. So Jesus is teaching his disciples this dependence and on him in every way. But ultimately, it's a huge moment for Jesus. When he's sent the people out, he, he has to decide, can he trust the ones he's chosen? Will they deliver what he's chosen them for? How much do they understand of him? How much do we need to understand of Jesus for him to make a difference in our lives? Because it's easy to be very childlike and just say, I love Jesus. I think he's great. You know, and uh, Jesus can be my friend. And, you know, Jesus, so we can make Jesus a sort of add-on to our lives. But if you know anything about Jesus... And his identity, you know, that he can never just ever be just an add-on to our lives, can he? He has to be everything or nothing. And that's a big thing, isn't it? So we'll see that as we go through tonight. And um, the disciples have to come to terms with this as well. Everything that we do then hangs on <coughs> who we say he is. It's our gospel identity. And our gospel identity, who we believe Jesus is, has implications for us. But first of all, it has implications for Jesus. And we'll see that in a second. So Jesus is praying and he asks them, who do you say that I am? And the time does come for everybody. And this is really important, isn't it, for anyone who is, you know, people we're talking to about Christ. Anyone, I don't know if there's anyone here tonight who hasn't made that decision. But ultimately, our life changes the moment we answer this question. Who do you say that I am? It's a crucial question for everybody, isn't it? What do you think about Jesus? Talking with a couple of people this afternoon about this, what... What we say about Jesus, what we say about sin, what we say about what is, what, what's wrong with the world and how, he's put it, you know, how it's, it's been put right and what we can do about that. All hangs on who we think Jesus is. Is he the saviour that has rescued mankind and has changed the course of history? Or is he just a friend that we have in our lives or is he somebody we, can, you know, we kind of ignore altogether? We need to decide in our hearts and even as Christians we need to constantly every morning decide and again answer that question. Who I think Jesus is today will change the way this day goes. And some of the decisions that I make. And some of the conversations that I have. It's true for all of us as Christians when you think about it. And so for the disciples here, there's no more speculation or rumour. It's not about what other people are saying. It's not what other people think of him. It's not what the people in the church say. It's not what Will says from the front. It's what I think of who Jesus is. If somebody was to ask me outside of the church or even one of my friends within the church and it's a good question to ask each other sometimes what you who would you if, if, if you were to ask to describe who Jesus is for you not just generally objectively but 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 subjectively who do you think Jesus is what would you say to them I'm not that's a rhetorical question I have to answer it now but what would you say how would you explain Jesus to people and what he means to you because it's not what anyone else says, it's about what you say that matters. All of us who want to be disciples of Jesus have to answer this question. Jesus said, we read this this morning, we mentioned this this morning, didn't we, in John 14. I am the way, the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. And so this question and that statement, every single person in this planet at some point will have to face that and answer those those. You know, what do we think about that statement? What are you going to do with that statement? Because Jesus isn't only ever going to be halfway there. He's either everything or he's nothing. And for you, it, what you say about him, what you believe about, that matters. It matters for now and it matters for eternity, doesn't it? It becomes who you are. Being a Christian isn't something like part of your social. It's like not joining the bowls club or the cricket club 
or the darts club or you know, whatever it might be, the sewing circle, whatever it could be. It's not that, is it? It's got to be so much where it changes everything. See that? It's so important, isn't it? And we, we sometimes, those who have been Christians for years, forget this. We forget it because we're so used to following a lifestyle that has Jesus at the sort of centre of it with our church services and everything else that it can be, become just a slavish sort of obedience without realising it. And, it, you know, it's good for us. But ultimately, we have to be so convinced of who Jesus is that we can argue with or speak to our friends about, speak to others. And the more we know about who he is, the more we're likely to speak to our friends about him as well, in that sense. So Peter's answer to Jesus is very interesting, isn't it? And this is a huge moment for the church and for everyone. Because this, on this confession of, G, of Peter, the whole church is built. Because what Peter says, quite rightly, is that you are the Messiah. You are the Christ, the Son of God. You are the one we've been waiting for, one that everyone's been waiting for, to come and rescue this world. Now, we've been talking on, on Sunday mornings, if you've been here, uh, from Revelation. Jesus is what Peter's saying. He's the one that's been prophesied about in the Old Testament, the only one who's able to carry out God's divine will and, make it, uh, and his judgments and everything else on the world. And he's the only one who can bring grace to the world. He's the only one who can save people from the judgment that's coming on this world. He's the only one who can rescue us from the consequences of our rebellion. He's our only hope in the whole of this world. There is no other hope apart from Christ. We, we, we don't preach any other gospel. There is no good news that Christians have for this world except Jesus. Now we need to believe that. And he needs to be the person we talk about most when we're talking about our faith with other people. When we give our testimony, it's not my story, but it's his story and how he's dealt with me. And that's what must come across when we're talking to people, because he's so important in all of that. So, so that's what Peter meant when he said, you know, it was, I think the Holy Spirit had revealed it to him. I mean, how do we get to know who Jesus is? It's not just an intellectual thing, is it? It's when the Holy Spirit comes into us and convinces us that Jesus is the one who died for not just sin, but my sin. And he's the one who can raise me up on the last day. He's the one who will keep me safe for eternity. He's, what, he's my good shepherd and all that. These aren't just abstract concepts. These are real things. And we really believe it. I remember once going into a school in, um, in Kirby when we, we, I, we used to be ministering there. And it was one of the local schools doing an assembly. And the head, he was a bit of a wide boy, the head. You know, he, he was carrying on with a teacher from the other school, but that's another story altogether. Found that out later on. But anyway, um, but he was kind of, and he was kind of a bit sort of smarmy looking at it. And he, would, he, would, he loved his piano, so he wanted to play along with me when I was doing the guitar and what have you. Um, it was all right, it sounded great. And I, he always used to invite me to the staff, to his office afterwards, you know, to come and have a chat and stuff like that. And he said one thing, he said, it's great when you come here, he said, because it's as though you really believe the stuff that you're talking about. And I said, well, is there any other way to talk about it? I said, well, I actually said to him, well, it's a bit like you teaching. What you teach? And he said, geography. I said, well, it's as though you really believe that geography is really important. Because most of us don't. <laughs> that's, perhaps that's what it was. I, I, and I said to him, the only reason I ever did geography at school is so I could go on the field trips. That's like a lot of people did. But, you know, I, I, I'm glad I did now because it's, it's an interest now. But it wasn't, you know, a teenager. It's not the interest at school. But I said to him, listen, you know, this is, you know, this is, it's reality. And he was genuinely shocked that anybody could believe this stuff. But so are a lot of other people in the world, aren't they? Well, if you ask people what, who God is, you know, oh, these people who believe in the Sky Fairy and stuff like that. When, you know, there's, there's talk, whenever there's talk online, you get all those people coming out the woodwork and saying those things. Perhaps ridiculing, but perhaps just giving away their own ignorance of that. But, you know, we look out on them. We shouldn't judge them because they're kind of sad and they're lost people and we need, they need to be saved. So we should never, ever be underestimate how gracious God has been to show us just who Jesus is. And we should never, ever be shy of confessing who Jesus is to us. Not just who he is, like, uh, uh, academically, but who he is and what he means to me. Would you be able to do that if somebody was to ask you about that? Who do you say Jesus is? The other year, a couple of years ago, uh, there's a, every year there's a conference in London. It's usually around, somewhere around the Westminster area, the Evangelical Ministers Conference Association or whatever, conference. And um, loads of people come from all over the country. 
as it happens, mainly from the south because it's dearer for them. But lots of people come from all over the country. And every year, they, part of the conference is they just talk about a great Christian from the past whose kind of, his witness has been very strong or her witness has been very strong. And they, they have a presentation about that to encourage, you know, people in the room kind of thing. And the other year they spoke about Billy Graham. Now, Billy Graham was quite, in, in some ways, quite a controversial figure for some people because he was a little bit more open to some of the, you know, other more liberal Christian denominations than, than other people would be. But um, what was great about the, the presentation is that Billy Graham and his gospel preaching was so clear and so straightforward and so confident that it was a bit like the headmaster. The people were just in, in a world full of confusion and sort of grey areas. There was this light of the gospel that was preached with such certainty by a man who didn't sort of you weren't trying to please, you know, it wasn't as though he was kind of emotionally trying to make you come out to the front and, uh, and, and you know, oh, he had this charisma. He, he was a very charismatic sort of figure, but I don't think that was how he preached. Whenever I heard, I've heard him preach, it wasn't like that. It was just, here's the gospel. You need to come to Jesus. It's all about Christ. And people did. God used him amazingly, didn't he? But it was, it was that clarity of the statement of the gospel. This is who Christ is, and you need to turn to him. How bold would we be about preaching that kind of gospel today without being, you know, we know we'd be ridiculed and we know we'd be challenged and all the rest of it, but are we, are we clear on who Jesus is? Are you clear on who he is on what he's done? We don't need to be theologians. We just need to know what he's done for you. He's died in your place. He's taken your sin. And the reason that's important is because that's what we deserve. But he's done it for us. And he's taken the punishment and the judgment of our, our sin. So the Jesus is the Messiah, the fulfilment of everything that God wants is fulfilled. Everything that God wants from his world is fulfilled in Christ and is made available to us as Christians through him. And that's why he's so important, isn't he? And there was a lot of confusion in Jesus' day about who he was. Because remember, even Peter, one of the disciples, is when Jesus was being arrested, he drew a sword and he was, he was kind of ready to fight for Jesus if you like. And Jesus told him, no, you don't do that, Peter. That's not, that's not what my kingdom's about. I don't need the, the physical sword. When Jesus went, when he started his ministry, remember when he went to the temple, he's been presented by his mum and dad. He's about 12 years old and he gets lost and, and that, or they lose him. They're on the way back to Nazareth and he's not there and they go back for him. And they find him in, in, in the temple and he says he's about his father's business. Because ultimately, a disciple of Jesus Somebody who believes this is who Jesus is, it, like Jesus, is always about our Father's business. That's what we do. We're always about our Father's business. A spiritual, uh, spiritual thing, isn't it? And so our confession, if you like, of Christ would be something like, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the one who came to save me, to be my deliverer, my saviour from my sin, who will present me before my Father in heaven faultless, blameless for all eternity and it's only in his hands that I'm going to know that now those words might not resonate with the person you're talking to but you need to know what that means and understand that for yourselves don't we, you need to know that Romans 10 and verse 9 and 10 Paul says this to the people he's writing to in Rome and again he cuts through it all and says listen this is what it, this is what it means to answer that question who do you say he is if you confess with your mouth jesus is lord he's everything it's that old saying isn't it? if he's not lord of all he's not lord at all so if you say jesus is lord and believe in your heart that god raised him from the dead you will be saved if you're prepared to give everything to jesus and confess and agree with him about what he says about himself and about this world and about you then you uh, and you call him Lord and make him give up everything for him. Then you call him Lord and you believe that he's that, that he's not, you know sin has not conquered him, but he has conquered sin. Then he is your Lord, and that's what you need to believe about Jesus, isn't it? For it's with your heart you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess. It's both. So what do we believe about Jesus? It needs to move our hearts. But, gee, but here, Paul says, it does need to move our lips as well. We need to be able to confess who Christ is and be sure of that. Are we able to do that? 
Do we really understand and believe Jesus? It's the centre of God's big story. Centre of everything. The redeemer of mankind and our saviour. As I said, Jesus being who he is has implications for him. And Jesus goes on to talk about that in verse 22 of what we read before. And he said, the son of man, because he's who he is, he's the son of man, he's Jesus, must suffer many things. And be rejected by the elders, chief priests and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. So if you want to know who Jesus is, here it is. Jesus has talked about it. The implication of being Jesus is that he must suffer many things. Mustn't he? He must by, um, uh, um, be rejected by even those people, his seniors in the church. He's not trying to please men. He's trying to please his father in heaven. He knows that that's going to mean he's going to come into suffering. And um, he knows that ultimately he will die, but on the third day he'll be raised to life. And in many ways, he's saying, this is if you want to be a disciple, that's what you've got to be like too. If you say that that's who I am and you want to follow me, following me, that means that you need to suffer many things. Opposition, whatever it may be, it's going to come, isn't it? You need to feel like you've been rejected by a lot of people is in the process because people won't understand. People who should understand won't. And you must ultimately die, walk the Calvary Road and die to yourself because only then you will be able to be raised to a new life. So that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus, isn't it? That's what Jesus saw as his identity, isn't he? And he, he, gave up, he gave up his life. Jesus, although he was killed, he gave his life up, didn't he? And that's what we have to do. We need to be prepared to be despised and rejected. We need to be prepared to even give our very life into his hands. Because if that's who he is, Jesus said, if you're not prepared to give up everything you have, you can't be my disciple, didn't he? But there will be a resurrection as we've been seeing. And so Jesus in saying these things to his disciples said, are you sure you want this as your identity? When you say you love Jesus, is this what you mean? Are you prepared to give all this to him? Are you sure you want to identify with a suffering saviour? A, you know, a saviour who went to the cross, who suffered many things, but is risen again. Is that okay for you? Are you okay with that? Because that's what the, it means to follow Jesus. So this is quite hard hitting. This is how he turns ordinary things to extraordinary things. It's what it meant when the disciples gave those meagre portions to Jesus and he transformed them and he fed 5,000 people with them. But he can only do that if we surrender it to him, however meagre it may be. So Jesus is saying, are you sure you want this? Are you sure you believe this? So the implications, he goes on to then spell it out for us. And he said to them all, um, in verse 23 onwards, if anyone would come after me, so this, in case you don't understand, he's saying, if anyone of you would want to come after me and follow me, he must deny himself or herself. That's a very unpopular message in this world today, isn't it? Denying ourselves anything for anyone. It's all about me. People should be denying themselves for me, giving themselves up for me, because we're the centre of it. That's the biggest opposition to following Jesus, isn't it? It's not other people, it's me often. But he says you need to decide, deny yourself Take up your cross daily and follow me. And this picture is the, the Roman, the old picture of the, uh, you've all heard this before, I'm sure, you know, when people were being crucified in Jesus' day, it was a terrible, torturous, horrible death that uh, the Romans had for criminals. And in order, they didn't just want to kill them, you know, just quickly or whatever. It was a whole, whole way of, of humiliation in a sense that you have had to submit to the authorities of the Romans and you're going to lose your life. So you carry this cross. The actual cross you're going to be nailed to. You carry this cross round and carry it up to the place where you... That's why Jesus was made to carry his cross. And so the idea is it's, it's a witness to those people around you that I'm as good as dead. I've given everything. And so Jesus says, if you want to come after me, you have to be like one of those people who are being crucified. You have to take up your cross. You have to walk around denying yourself and following me. So it's not all about you anymore. You're casting it all on him in that sense, isn't it? And follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. And of course, we've been thinking about something of that in the mornings that we talk about Revelation. The rewards that we will have. And we'll look at them in, in the weeks to come. 
But you know, we can't keep we can't hang on to as much of this world as we can keep hold of and take that to heaven with us because it won't go. We give everything up to follow him. So Jesus ends up with this question. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his very soul or self? So again, these are hard hitting. Whenever Jesus talks about following him, he never ever sugarcoats it. It's always challenging teaching, isn't it? And it's it's it, you know we may have heard this a thousand times, a hundred times. We may be the first time we've heard it, but these words are always challenging because the longer you're a Christian, the easier it is to drift away from this sort of stuff. Who do you say Jesus is? If he really is your saviour, then this applies to you. Come after me. Take up your cross. Follow me. A life of Romans 12 verse 1, as Paul writes, living as living sacrifices, which is our reasonable, our orderly worship before him. Laying ourselves before him. In this way. And we do it daily, every morning, he says. Take up your cross daily. Every morning, giving the day to him, giving myself to him. Remembering he's the one and following him. And so, yeah, it's just right through the Gospels, all of this, isn't it? And he talks about all these things, isn't it? So that when we come to the end of this, and it's not, we're not being very long tonight, are we? And I think it's been a long day and you perhaps don't want to be here all night. But the, the question he leaves at the end is quite a, a strong question again, as if Jesus hasn't been strong enough already. In verse 26, difficult words. And he says this, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory and in the sorry in his glory and in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. He's talking about the day when he comes to harvest the earth we were talking about this morning. And if he says if we're ashamed of him, then he will be ashamed of us. That sounds like harsh. Oh, I can't imagine Jesus being ashamed of me. Love he's but you're my friend. You're the person I've used all my life to help me out of situations. You're the person who's healed me when I've prayed. I've prayed for healing constantly. And Lord, you're the healer. You're the one who does all those wonderful things. Lord, you're the one who kind of helps me when I'm praying for my friends or helps me when I'm praying for a new job or helps me when I'm praying for people in my family or my kids or whatever it might be. That's all Jesus been to us. He's been someone who's been at our beck and call. And if that's all it is, when it comes to the crunch and when he's asking us to give up everything we have, well, we don't do that. And that's as good as being ashamed of him. I'm not, I'm not confident enough in who he is to be able to do that. And that's why Jesus asked this question. Who do, who do you say that I am? Because if you're not convinced that I am the son of God, the saviour of the world, the one who is you know, the, the good shepherd who will take you through, if you're not convinced about him as a person and what he's done for you, then you're never going to follow him, are you? You're never going to follow him in the way that he says. And so Jesus will always be at your beck and call. And you will want him, like we said the other week, to be part of your story all of your life. And it sounds very good. And we think that's a good thing, a good living person. You want Christ in your life. I want God in my life. And that's not the way Jesus wants it. He says, no, 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 that's not. If you really knew who I was, you don't come to me like that. The way you come to me is to say, you know, like we said the other week, I don't, want to be, I don't want you to just be part of my story. I want to be part of what you're doing. I want to be part of your story. Whatever you want from me. Give up everything I have. And I'll follow you. Who do we say he is? As we finish this evening. Who do you say Jesus is? If you were to confess it to one another. What would you, how would you describe him personally for yourself? What difference... Has he made in your life? Not just the things he's done for you, practically and all that, because he does do those things. But what difference does it mean that you're a Christian tomorrow morning when you go out to whatever you're doing? When you face the illness, when you face the family problems, or when you're walking and things are going well, or when you get the promotion, or when you, you, know, you get the thing that you really want, or life seems good. Where's Christ in the middle of all of that? How important is he to you? Who gets the credit? Who are, your living, who are you living for in that sense? Who do you say he is? What's your idea? It, it's, it's a matter of your identity because when we have Jesus, in, when we load Jesus in the way he wants us to and when we can say he's my saviour and Lord, it changes who we are. Everything's about him and what he wants us to do. And ultimately, if everything's not about him, it's as though we're being ashamed of him. And if everything's not about him, and we haven't committed ourselves to him in that way, then 
on the last day when he comes and calls us, he'll, there'll be find no basis for us to take take us to heaven with him, because we've just been using him as a, a crutch to lean on rather than a, a, a person to live by and to live through and, and to share our life with. So are you ashamed of Jesus and his life and his death and his words and his purposes for you? Are you ashamed of his words about all the things that he says, the difficult stuff in the Bible that other people don't believe in and, 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 and the way the church is trying to question them today? It comes into all of it, doesn't it? Are we going to stand by what Jesus said and give everything to him? Are we choosing to identify with him in the Calvary road that we have to walk daily? Taking up our cross. Paul referred to Chris himself. He said in 1 Corinthians 4, he was talking about them. And the, the Corinthians were a very proud bunch and very sort of academically. They, they loved to the debate and what have you. And there was all sorts of different viewpoints in this debating room in Corinth and what have you. And it was a very sort of um, liberal society. And he said, we've become like, as Christians, the scum of the earth. That's what he actually uses that phrase. 1 Corinthians 4.13, if you don't believe me. Are we prepared to be like that? Because that's what Jesus was treated like in the end, wasn't he? Or do you want to be liked by the world? Do you want to be loved by the world? Do you want to have everything that the world offers with Jesus added on? Because that's not following Jesus, is it? That's following ourselves. And as I said at the start, I, Jesus says, I am the only way. I am the only truth. I, don't, I know the only way to life to live. Are you willing to give everything to me? Nobody comes to the Father except by me. Who do you say he is? It'll define your gospel mission, what's important to you in life. It'll define where you spend eternity when you answer that question. And the answer will define what you believe fullness of life means so you read what J jesus says in uh, or john records for us jesus say in john chapter 10 he said i've come that you might have life and have it to the full how would you interpret that as a christian as somebody who follows jesus how do you interpret that verse is fullness of life of to you being always healthy always having everything that you need having the right job that you want having your circumstances and all your ducks in a row everything's fine and, and having all good relationships and having you know the best of things. This is the, the Jesus I have. And sometimes when we see things and we see people talking, and Christians I know, lovely people, talk about God is good because he does this for me, he does that for me, he answers that prayer, he heals here, he does that there, he does all these things. And it's all about me. <coughs> Fullness of life is all about me getting what I want, just like the rest of the world. Or are we content with whatever God brings us. And we've learned like Paul. To be content in plenty or in want. In sickness or in health. In prison or out of prison. Because that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus isn't it? Knowing that this life isn't all there is. There is more to come. Is that enough for you? Is that what fullness of life means for you and for me? When I was reading this this week and thinking about this, it was a real challenge to me because we are so easily entangled in what the world thinks is fullness of life. But fullness of life for a Christian is all wrapped up in who we say Jesus is. And only that. And Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you have to give all that up. Not that I won't give you anything, but you have to give all that up and rely on me, depend on me totally. If you are not prepared to give everything you have, you can't be my disciple. You trust it into my hands. And we need to remind ourselves of that daily. Take up our cross. Die to ourself. It's all practical stuff, this. And follow him. So that's hard hitting, isn't it? And a challenge for us again tonight. And a reminder. I know most of you here tonight know all this. So I'm not telling you anything new. But like me, perhaps this week and you're tonight, and again tonight, as I'm, reading, as I'm speaking these words out and saying these things, it's a challenge to me. What am I going to be like tomorrow morning? Am I only going to be happy if I'm getting what I want? Or if I, am I happy and content because Christ is my saviour and I'm in his hands? Because that's what it comes down to. Who do you say I am, says Jesus. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us this evening. We thank you, Lord, that you give us, you challenge us through your word in this way. And Lord, it is a big challenge because we, we, we are 
in a world that is making everything we want, everything laid out for us, we want all the things that everyone else has got. We live in a very materialistic world. And it's easy to be satisfied for a moment by all the little trinkets that we can get for having success in various areas. But Lord, for, for us, we recognise tonight, Lord, that you've called us to more than that. You've called us to be your followers no matter what. And for us to be not to, for us not to have a story that we want you to fit into but for us to seek your face to put to lay our lives as a sacrifice before you and allow you to live uh, through us and us to be part of your story so lord help us we pray when we challenge that challenge our hearts again this evening lord and help us to work out what it means and to answer that question who we say that you are and we ask this in jesus name amen Let's say the grace to close tonight, okay? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us evermore. Amen.